Gender Wars is a curiously titled game developed by the 8th Day and Sales Curve Interactive exclusively for personal computers in 1996. This is a game that truly flew under the radar when it originally came out, and the few outlets that did check it out gave it pretty middling reviews. So needless to say, the game was quickly forgotten amongst most gamers. The only reason that I even knew about it was because I actually bought this at Kmart. Anybody remember that store? Anyone? You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. They had that giant red K out front, right? And wait, you've already played this? <laughs> yep. Great, you can pull from your previous experiences with the game to smoothly guide us through this review. Hmm, yeah, well, uh, We'll get to that. Cryptic. Do we know anything about the team that created this obscure title? The Eighth Day? No, not much. Just that they operated from 1991 to 1996, and in that time released a grand total of four games. That's not a lot of software. Nope. The Eighth Day was not well known, not long lived, and didn't have a large body of work. But the co-developers on this title, they were a bit more notable. Sales Curve Interactive, also known as SCI. They released tons of interactive bits and bytes from the edge of the 80s all the way into the 2000s. But for the Eighth Day, well, this was the last video game they would ever release. Hmm, see a lot of death knell games around these parts. Guess we know how this will play out. Oh, I think it could be worse than usual. I mean, not many games leave me scratching my head after reading their genre alone. Right, right, we completely skipped over the genre of the game in the opening. What do we got? The tagline on the box calls it the ultimate arcade strategy. The ultimate arcade strategy? Arcade and strategy? A little weird. Any other genre clues? Nope, just a big old title. So it offers the fast and frantic gameplay of an arcade game alongside the methodical, calm-paced playstyle of a classic strategy title? Those genres go together about as well as pineapple on pizza. I'll have you know pineapple on pizza is one of the greatest- Jane, focus. Right, well, I guess we're gonna have to find out what all this means the only way we know how. It's time we dive into the trenches and discover what this battle is all about in Gender Wars. See, the tartness of the pineapple balances with the fattiness of the- Jane! Tree. Fine. The game begins with an educational TV program titled Wars We've Had. It details the so-called gender wars. Let's have a gander. And welcome to another educationally invigorating installment of Wars We've Had. In today's edition, we'll be taking a look at probably the most controversial, if not the strangest war that ever happened, the gender war. We have with us two of the most eminent historians in the solar system, Professor Jonathan Henry Smythe, and all the way from the newly terraformed Mars, Professor Sarah Muchley Jones. Tonight's guests will start with a brief historical jaunt, looking at the roles of both men and women before the war. Into the 21st century and the first president of the newly formed POW, the Pact of Western Countries. A female president, I might add. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, come on. The women were put in these positions of power by men because it was politically advantageous to have them there. A bit of equality here, a bit of equality there. Worked wonders in political circles. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bloody Do you ever time. listen to what we have to say? No. Drives you just live in your own self-assured little world. Oh, shut your face. It drives a man to kill, you know. It's bloody insane. Give them an inch, they take a mile. And I've got six inches here, mate. They're not getting hold of any of them. What the heck were they trying to get at with this? Instead of filling us in on important background info, the game's decided to give us this. Did you know that implants can do wonders for oh, a man go, your age? Oh, here we go. You'd know, dear, wouldn't you? We're silicone. Uh, what? Uh, How can you possibly the justify the existence leader, of your yeah. allies and women? You got nothing but mood swings and tempers. No wonder men went to war. Fun! This goes on and on till the game finally decides to have mercy and abruptly cuts the footage. Did we get anything from this? Besides a migraine? No, but there's gotta be lore somewhere. Check the manual. All right, let's see. Well, we've got an eight page account of the events leading up to this war, four pages dedicated to the female faction's perspective, and four pages dedicated to the male factions. The perspective they're perspecting on? A no joke battle between men and women that split the two into standalone warring factions. If you're looking for a thought provoking science fiction narrative that offers interesting social commentary, go visit a library. But if 
you're looking for extremely gendered stereotypes straight from the 90s and terrible humor with the subtlety of a bag of feral cats, well, here is game. We'll spare you where we were not and put a pause on this juvenile narrative attempt for now. They make us choose between two factions, male or female. Let's just pick male for now. The game begins. We see a soldier surrounded by monitors. This here is your operating hub. You got squad select, training, options, and a briefing section. What you won't find? A tutorial mission. You know, something to teach you how to play. Yeah, that training section, not gonna show you how to do squat. What you'll find is a training section to train your soldiers, but it does not show you how to play anything. Oh, that's a shame. How do we learn how to play? Well, the creators did do one thing to kind of help players along. This a physical card in the game box that tells you how the game operates. That's all the help you get. In 1996, this kind of design wasn't unheard of, but it was never enjoyable and has certainly not aged well. But I digress. Let's check out our briefing and figure out what we're up to. Our first mission, scrambled eggs. We're given a primary objective as well as optional secondary objectives. The primary objective, a starter mission classic. Locate and acquire four ovum storage tubes? Man, when will developers stop making us collect ovum storage tubes. When it stops being fun, man. And let me tell you, still riveting. Oh, and if you, if you want, we, we, we can kill a bunch of technicians or something. I don't know, it sounds like a yawn fest. Now, let's go back to that plot we pulled back from earlier. As silly as it sounds, this whole ovum thing is essential to the game's story. You see, they have resorted to cloning and artificial reproduction to maintain populations since the males and females have separated. <laughs> Dumb. What's stopping a stork from landing on the doorstep with a, a chubby little sky baby? <clears throat> uh, you need to talk about this later. I don't follow. As one might expect, reproduction technologies have become targets for military operations and gender wars. It's in very poor taste, and we apologize for this game's insane plot. Now that we know our mission, we select our team, because that's right, folks, you're playing as a squad of four soldiers, not just one. Now, obviously, you're going to pick the top soldiers from the squad that seem to have the best stats, right? Gang straight, my dude. Off to battle. We get to see an animated cutscene of our soldiers going to the mission, flying in some aircraft and shockingly the pilot is inebriated oh it's okay i i can handle it because men like beer yeah that there's the comedic tone of this game oh hold on Look. looks like we're in for a crash landing i'm too young to die oh no and the mission begins with a perfectly landed aircraft? Sure, whatever. Your soldiers vacate the vehicle, showcasing the apocalyptic landscape the world has become. They enter a bunker that acts as a passageway to the secret underground female base. We meet our first enemies here. Goes pretty smoothly. We're on the top of this building and we've got to get down. Look, an elevator. Yeah, an elevator, big enough for one soldier, one at a time. So we take one soldier, go down, move on to another elevator, and then sometimes the other soldiers will automatically follow the first one, but sometimes they won't. Like this one, confused with how elevators work, I guess. So you'll need to independently select each of the four soldiers to move them along each elevator. <sighs> Getting to the ground floor takes a stupefying three elevators, four trips each. This is the first interaction you have with a level in this game. Why are there multiple elevators? And why are they so tiny? Couldn't we have had one large elevator that fit all soldiers at once? Eventually, we regroup at the bottom and start going through the, uh, wait. Where are we going? I don't know. Pull out the map. Which key is the map key? Um, let me see. Both the manual and the info card don't say. Maybe there isn't one. What do you mean there isn't a map? Uh, click that M on the screen there. Looks like that's our mission and objectives. It's gotta be somewhere. What does that big letter B do when you click it? Ah! Why is that thing shooting us? What is even happening? Oh, according to the reference card, B stands for Barrage Droid. Cool. Well, I guess we gotta run around without a map. Can't be much of a problem, right? I mean, how big could this level be? Nothing here. Nothing here either. Gotta turn around. Where are we even going? Where are these tubes we're looking for? Oh, look, here's one. 
Okay, I guess we gotta find a couple more. There's so much level here, it's incredible. Incredible? Yes, but also bad. This size clearly showcases the necessity of a map. This place is one huge, annoying maze. The briefing showed us a vague 3D model of the world, but it didn't show the interior workings of buildings. You have no way of knowing where you're going or how to get to the place you need to get to. But at the very least, our soldiers seem to be tough. They can take on anyone that comes across them and... <laughs> Oh wow, did we seriously get a complete game over? Looks like we did. How? You saw our squad roster, right? We had tons of other soldiers we should be able to bring into battle. Okay, looking through the manual again. Uh, here, it says, you must have a squad leader amongst your chosen troops to head up each mission. If you manage to kill all your squad leaders, you won't be able to blast off into another battle and the game will be over? Wait, are you telling me that all the soldiers with good stats we picked were squad leaders? Yeah, huh? This guy, stuck on the elevator. Squad leader. Squad leader. Let me see that manual. Oh, great! Says the same soldiers can have problems like being too aggressive or having too low intelligence. Wait, those things can get them killed in missions? So the game wants you to build a squad of inferior troops to avoid a game over, but by using inferior troops, you have a greater possibility of the squad bailing? Yeah, I guess. The game's a brilliantly stupid perpetual failure machine. Remember when you thought my past experiences would help us get through this? Yeah? This is my past experience. I never beat this level. This was all I ever saw of this game. Nope, nope, okay, this is wrong. This is totally wrong. We're on the first mission and the game is clearly riddled with issues. Oh, I agree. That whole arcade strategy genre they thought they were, I don't know, inventing? It's not working. And to fully understand and how much of a failure this game is, we need to look at a title that used a very similar gameplay style. And that would be the Bullfrog Productions classic cyberpunk styled Syndicate. A series of games that started humbly as a real-time combat point-and-click strategy game. But not in the same style as a straight-up real-time strategy game, like StarCraft or Age of Empires. No, this one has got a bit of a twist. In Syndicate, you control a group of operatives in an isometric perspective where you are tasked with completing objectives. Sound familiar? Syndicate was unique for its time because its real-time style of gameplay hadn't really been done much before. So, no, Gender Wars isn't really an action strategy game. It's more like a Syndicate-style game, which is more like a real-time tactics action game. Here, give me that marker. Ah, there we go. Wow, Shane, you can't spell. I know. And while you might think, hey, that's not fair, you can't blame them for not knowing about Syndicate. Well, folks, we kinda can. Syndicate dropped in 1993 and arrived on multiple platforms, not just PC. It was a major release, a staple game years before Gender Wars was released in 96. Bullfrog Productions was a legendary development house, not just in its native United Kingdom, but throughout the rest of the world. By the 90s, if you were in the business of making video games and happened to live in the UK, you knew Bullfrog, and you knew their games. And while we can't confirm where developer The Ape Day was located, we're more than a little certain they hailed from the land of the Union Jack. Why? Well, because of the game's intro. You see, two of the game's main voice actors, the ones from the intro, Drives You just live in your own self-assured little uh, world. Shut your face. Paul Darrow and Jacqueline Pierce. Both of these actors appeared on a distinctly British sci-fi series called Blake 7, something the developers likely saw and were fans of, inspiring them to bring the two talents on board their project. No brains, no brains, can oh, you hear fun, me? All you How did you even know these two were on Blake 7? The same way I know that the show was created by Terry Nation, who had created the Daleks on Doctor Who. I watch a lot of British television, Adam. Don't even get me started on Red Dwarf. Red what? Glad you asked. It's the 21st century aboard the Jupiter Mining Corporation spaceship Red Dwarf. Never mind. You know, this whole British link would actually explain a lot of the dialogue in the game being very British English forward. Right, lads. Oh yeah, that's as British as being on toast. What? Heinz family baked beans originated in the late 1800s and be- Never mind. But back to Syndicate, a game with a similar playstyle that released before Gender Wars. Right, so 
Here's how Syndicate opens. You get a small level with a single goal, assassinate a target. The level can be easily completed in a few minutes. It's giving you a simple introduction to the game and its mechanics, kind of a trial by fire. No training, you just need to figure it out. Of course, you can read the game's handy dandy manual for assistance, but the game doesn't go out of its way to explain anything. And because the mission is so simple and the map is so tiny, it's not hard to figure out on your own. Gender Wars didn't do this. And while we have a nice little on-screen map in Syndicate which points out enemies and objectives, Gender Wars didn't do that either. So we wandered around this huge map for what felt like an eternity looking for our primary objective, Overdubs. Despite the lack of helpful direction, we actually found them. But that was only the beginning. Yeah, you better hope that the characters who are carrying said tubes don't die. Why, you may be wondering. Do they drop the items on the floor, leaving the remaining squad members to pick them up? Oh no, it's worse. If a member of your squad dies while carrying an item, the item permanently disappears, forcing you to restart the entire mission. And dying, it'll come easy to your squad. They dumb. Dumb as rocks. Nine times out of ten, they're unable to complete the simple task of following a lead character. They get lost. They get confused. They get stuck. And that's not even taking into consideration the squad direction mechanic. See, you can dictate orders to your squad, like stick close together or shoot anything that moves. And when friendly AI goes off on their own, it's a bad time. It's so random where they go and who they attack without your input. They can get into situations where they start massive firefights and don't have the slightest chance of survival. Yes, the enemy AI is also dumb, but they're at least direct. They see you, they attack. If they don't see you, well, they're stuck with a severe case of the morons. Very stupid. Like, I'm killing all your friends around you and you're just standing there like a rock, stupid. Or I'm shooting at you but happen to be on a separate level and you are still standing like a rock while being shot at, stupid. But what about when you take direct control? Isn't the combat better, you may be asking? Let's get into combat. The weapons all operate the same. Aim with mouse, click to shoot. The closer you are to the target, the better your aim. See, you have increased weapon spread the further back you are. So that means, despite the fact you're clicking square on the target, your shot may not actually land. You gotta go out of your way to get closer to the thing that is likely trying to kill you. Isn't that great? Oh, and can't forget to mention, this game has infinitely spawning enemies. These little booths here, they spit out, I guess, insta-baked clone soldiers without end. No way to destroy these machines, but you can disable them. They jut out clones if enemy soldiers nearby spy you or if you're in a security camera's line of sight. So destroy the cameras, then take out all the existing foes and you're in the clear. Until the next one, that is. Sometimes it can be pretty hectic with multiple soldiers, multiple robots, <laughs> multiple hidden cameras, and even multiple turrets showing up all over the place. Hectic is right, and not just because of your interactions with enemies, the whole dang world can become splattered with busyness. Look at this! Crazy, destructive environments! Feels like the developers put an insane amount of effort into the game world's destruction. Practically everything can be destroyed. It's actually very impressive. Like a John Woo film. However, instead of enjoying the visual splendor of it all, this can be a massive problem. See, objects that get destroyed sometimes blow up or cause chain reaction explosions that hurt your entire squad. Your squad can and will shoot enemies on their own, and they accidentally hit random things. If they shoot something explosive, they and everyone else around will take damage. I think it's a good time to mention the shield system in this game. Ah! You see, every friendly soldier has a shield that offers a bit of protection protection before it quickly depletes to zero. You may want to find out how to recharge your shield so that you can actually finish these missions in one piece. Uh, we certainly did. We completed a bunch of our gameplay assuming we couldn't. There's these energy regeneration booths. They're infrequent and hard to find. But when you do see one, you walk your soldier inside and their energy bar fills back up. That bar represents energy that some special weapons can use. Right, but you'll notice that your shield energy isn't getting replenished. Well, that's because you need to push the negative or positive symbol on your keyboard to shift the energy from your weapon energy to your shield energy.
Do they explain this on the instruction card or in the manual? No, you're expected to figure it out on your own. Why not charge both at the same time? Even if you learn this trick early on, it's not so helpful. You don't find a lot of these booths around and going hunting for anything in a game with no map and terrible combat like this? Not a great idea. But fellas, why not just save your progress so when you die, you don't need to stop back at the beginning? Good point. This game doesn't have mid-mission saving. Ah. And yes, not all games had mid-mission saves back then. Syndicate didn't offer them. Here's the thing though, Syndicate was a couple years older and also it was a properly designed game where you had a fair chance at finishing levels intact. But when you're up against sprawling and comprehensible levels with no minimap, and pathetic character AI, alongside a constant barrage of enemies, and practically non-existent shield energy refills, well, being able to save your game becomes a bit of a necessity. But let's say against all odds, you've done it. You've completed your primary objective with your squad more or less intact. Think you're home free? <laughs> no. After all this, if you happen to complete your objectives like a good soldier, time to backtrack. Sometimes they have you zigzag back through the entire map all the way to the starting location to complete a mission. Keeping your squad alive through this pointless tour back through the map? Near impossible! How did Syndicate wrap up missions? Let's see, uh, well, when your objectives were done, that was it. Press the space bar. Bingo bango, move along! Next mission. Uh, but don't worry, you don't always need to backtrack to the beginning location in Gender Wars to complete a mission. No, sometimes you need to go to a completely different location, meaning you need to find an arbitrary second location that you've never been to once you've completed all your objectives. Again, no in-game map to show you where that is. No indication where you'll need to be. If the briefing stated it, you need to commit that to memory and hope that the map they showed you made some kind of sense. Oh, and in case the gameplay hasn't kept you on your toes enough, more often than not, they place high-level enemies near this new location who will kill you. Just before you reach the final door to exit the stage, I mean, look how close I was! Ah! As you can see, Pretty frustrating. Uh, we figured we'd toss the mail campaign to the side. Will you be quiet? I'm trying to arrange my dead toenail collection. And maybe try the female campaign, see if it suffered the same issues. And surprise, surprise. Just like with the male faction, we're met with insulting stereotype gags delivered in useless cutscenes followed by the exact same style of gameplay in another stage that is way too large. If anything, this first level is worse than in the other campaign because of how confusing it is. This is a stealth mission in the communication sector. You need to find a communication network and place some kind of listening gizmo in it. Sounds straightforward, right? Only when the briefing tells you to do this, it points to a section of the map that doesn't look like the one you got dropped off in. Yeah, sometimes these blood red virtual boy like 3D designs are confusing in and of themselves. We're in another sprawling map with dead ends and repeated sections. No idea where to go. Why did they design so many false paths? Who had the time to make this game so miserable? So we're on the hunt for this console. We see the image once during the briefing and never again. Better burn that sucker into your memory and hope you remember it after an hour of brutal gameplay. It's not here or here or in here. Oh, of course, there's tons of desks and consoles, but not that one specific console we need to find. Where the heck is it? Oh, it's there. I guess that red chair was kind of a tell since no other desk had a red chair? Eating either of the opening missions is no easy task, but it only gets more torturous from there. The game layers on the patient's prodding issues like they're going out of style. <clears throat> a few of these include... Knock back damage. If you walk into a new screen and get shot by an enemy, you're pushed back to the old screen. If you walk through again, the enemies are in their exact last position and will fire at you instantly, pushing you back out to the previous zone. You need to juggle this on repeat in a fruitless attempt to shoot them before they shoot you. Reused levels. You revisit spaces you've already played. The dead ends we complained about? Turns out they're alternate paths that open up for different missions. Trudge through the same dumb spaces with no navigational familiarity. Why didn't they block out hallways you don't need to travel down? No clue. Enjoy the repetition. Too many elevators. They are scattered everywhere. Later on, they introduce large elevators that can fit all four squad members. If you could always have them, why include individual elevators 
at all? What purpose did this serve? Why? Why? Permanent stunt glitches. The second female mission. One of the soldiers gets stuck on an elevator with no way to escape. We completed all mission objectives, but have no way to return to the exit zone without them. We need to restart the entire level from the beginning. Yeah! Overly complicated mission objectives. On the third male mission, you must capture 10 civilians and bring them back to your base. You use a specific weapon that captures people in floating blue balls. Yeah, I know, it sounds funny. You need to bring these encapsulated civilians to an elevator, but they move like a conga line with all broken traversal AI problems quadrupled. Doing all of this through a bunch of mini elevators is the stuff of nightmares. Impossibly difficult missions. Mail mission five, a stealth mission. Well, that's what they tell you anyway. There appears to be no usable stealth mechanics in this game. They force you to make use of one soldier. One! Alone! You have to take on countless soldiers, destroy facilities, and uh, oh yeah, a freaking tank all by yourself. And if you think taking on a single heavily armored near invincible tank isn't hard enough, well they throw a couple more at you for good measure. Uh. Infinite enemies with no defense. Remember when we said you were able to destroy security cameras to prevent those boxes from spawning more enemies? Well, later on, they decide to remove that feature. Now, whenever you are near a cloning booth, they instantly spit out endless soldiers. There is no stopping them. Herd your dumb AI sheep and run for the hills. Woo! It really seems like this game is purposely designed to force you to give up in frustration. Which is why we felt no guilt, after constant dead ends and unsurmountable waves of enemies, in using an invincibility cheat code. I mean, how else did they expect us to get through something like this? The cheat that we used is placed during the in-between mission saving system by typing the words... Buy a PlayStation. Seeing how this game wasn't released on the old Sony system, I think the developers were sending a message. Yeah, better off not bothering with this game. Play the Bandicoot one instead. Yeah. I wish we could say that basic movement, AI, and combat were the only things functionally broken in this game, but they're not. The options volume setting for music? It doesn't work. No matter what you set it to, the music is always on. Usually this wouldn't harm your overall gameplay experience, but not in this location. This is a dance club. Dance clubs have music. Music. The music in the dance club is treated like a sound effect, not actual background music. The video game itself has its own background music, not treated like a sound effect. So, what happens when you enter the dance club and both worlds collide? Like two DJs combined forces to liquefy your frontal lobe. Sounds grated into your head aren't the only sensory bashing problem in this game. We found our eyes pelted with bizarre visual choices that completely dismiss the logic of the world created for this title. Like these night versions of levels, it's tough to see. Which makes sense, right? Because it's nighttime? Until you really start to think about it. Because this game takes place below the apocalyptic wasteland above. This is all underground. They artificially light the world underground ground for most missions. So why would it ever be pitch black down here? Not even the lights that you do see seem to light up anything. Now look at this! We got posters of women on the walls in the male base. Shouldn't this be violating some kind of rule set by their faction? They're at war, but are given the okay to, uh, how do we put this, develop feelings for the enemy? I don't know what it is that I like about this, but it just seems to really appeal to me on an emotional level. I just want to keep looking at it. Enjoy it. <laughs> There are also faction-specific missions that take place in their own perspective bases. This is a real head-scratcher. Why would either side of this stupid war need to escape from its own base? How does that make any sense? I mean, look, the men's military building is literally right there. And you get gross things that are supposed to be jokes, maybe? Like in this reproduction facility. Oh, look, they're making snowmen, huh? Don't really see any snow around. Just a bunch of jars filled with a creamy white liquidy substance. Oh.
I think I'm gonna be sick. Time to move on, I think. The game ends with a mission in which your team needs to capture the leader of the opposing faction and truck them back to an escape zone. It's brutal, unfun, and way too long. It all ends with a cutscene returning to the TV program we caught at the beginning of the game. Here, they quickly reveal that your faction won the gender wars. And a year later, some disaster happened and everyone acted as if there was never a gender war in the first place. Then the seemingly impossible happened. A year after the end of the war, as we all know, the crisis occurred. Great way to just shrug away a nonsense plot in this miserable pile of game. Pointless. The game's a stupid coded offense dump with a tiny, pale, vaguely Syndicate-inspired core. Seriously, folks, just go play Syndicate. It's better. Or maybe try other action games from around the same period. There's Crusader, No Remorse, which, for its time, showcased impressive visuals and implemented sprawling maps that feel way more focused. Don't need to worry about a team, either. Or, if you want a game in which you manage a group, try Cannon fodder, a game that allows you to control multiple units very well with a mouse alone. It's a war-themed game title that is really fun. Heck, you know what's crazy? The same year that Gender Wars released, Syndicate saw a full 3D sequel, Syndicate Wars. Put gameplay from these games side by side, and Gender Wars looks positively ancient, visually and from a gameplay perspective. We can't say time and effort didn't go into Gender Wars. You can tell the development team tried to implement some creative ideas in the game's absolutely enormous play spaces. I mean, the sheer amount of time it would have taken to craft all the assets in this game, on top of making the majority of them destroyable, that's no small feat. But the way this game plays, the way it informs the player, the way the story and humor hit? If possible, place this tranquilizer pack in the main beer vat. Oh boy, this game misses. It misses all those things, big time. The narrative alone is insulting to every gender it tries and fails to satirize. The humor in this thing would have had players shaking their heads even in the time frame of the game's original release. Look, I think we're done here. Retreat, scream for a medic, raise the white flag, because this game, it's just bad.